Hello and welcome once again to another episode of Interesting Stories in the History of Diagnostics. This is Mickey Yurde for Halteris Associates, and today I'm going to be talking about the Iceman, Utsi. And by the way, there's a YouTube video on how to pronounce it properly. I'm sure I'm still not pronouncing it properly, but it's not Utsi, it's not Utsi, it's Utsi, or something quite like it. So, you may have heard of the, of the Iceman. This was the mummy that was found by two German tourists in the Utsal Alps between Austria and Italy in 1991. And of course, that's where the Utsi name comes from. And he had died quite a long time before that. Studies have shown that he died somewhere between 2105 and 3349 BC, or before the Common Era, as they say now. He's been studied extensively, and we're going to talk about a lot of that here today. But he is currently housed in the Southern Tyrol Museum of Archaeology in Bolzano, Italy. Just to give you some sense of where that stands in history, at that period between about 3100 and 3200 BCE, we had, for instance, in Mesopotamia, the city of Uruk, which at its height, it was still 300 years away from when it would have its most famous king, Gilgamesh. We had the pharaoh Narmer in Egypt, who had just unified Upper and Lower Egypt, and it was beginning to see the first signs of Egyptian hieroglyphs. And then all the way over in Mesoamerica, we had the Mayan culture, and their long count calendar actually starts in 3114 BCE. So lots going on then. But Europe was not all that populated at that point, and that's of course where our dear Utsi was found. Utsi stood about five foot three inches, weighed about 110 pounds, and was about 45 years of age. He was well clothed. He actually had a number of different types of leather clothing on. He had a cloak made of woven grass. He had shoes that were very well constructed. In fact, uh, many people believe they were actually snowshoes. He was in the Alps, of course. And to top it all off, he had a bare skin cap. Really quite, quite something. He had on him two birch wood baskets that were filled with a number of things, including over a dozen different types of plants. And I'll talk about some of the other things he had in there in a little while. And he carried a copper axe that was 99.7% pure. Incredible. Must have been quite a, a rare thing to have. So he was well clothed, well supplied. He also had a kit that contained a flint and pyrite for making fires. I mean, just really quite amazing what this man was carrying with him in his long trek through the Alps. Analysis of his bones, his tibia, fibula, the pelvis, indicated that he was probably someone who walked extensive distances over hills, which was evidently not a typical situation in Europe at that time or in other parts of the world. The cause of his death has been controversial for quite a long time, but at this point, the best thinking is that he actually had been shot with an arrow, which people hadn't recognized early on, had probably bled to death after having been shot. And curiously, DNA analysis, which I'm going to come back to in a couple of moments here, indicated that there were blood samples on him from at least four other people. And there's been a lot of discussion about what does that mean? Was he in battle? Was he with someone else he was actually carrying over his shoulder because one blood spot was there? Very interesting, but not well understood at this point. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the diagnostics that have been used on poor Utsi in terms of his origins and his health status. Both autosomal DNA and mitochondrial DNA analysis indicate that he was probably from the Southern European area, although he has an unusual set of haplotypes and characteristics, but he's most closely related to people in the Corsican and Sardinian region of today. Interestingly, a few years ago, analysis was done on 3,700 men in the Tyrol region, where he is now housed and was found, and found that there were approximately 19 people in that group who were either close relatives of his or distant relatives. Rather interesting, 5,300 years later, amazing. If you're not familiar with haplotype analysis, it, it's actually the group of alleles that's inherited from one parent. And since we're looking at mitochondrial DNA, which comes from just the mother, it is the haplotype of the mother. There's been a lot of work over the years in haplotype analysis that goes back to Alan Wilson at University of California, Berkeley, way back in the late 70s where they were looking at the mitochondrial inheritance and what you might call the founding mothers of the human race, looking at the, the probable original population of humans that gave rise to all of us today. They believed that there were seven of these original mothers based on the haplotypes they can find. Now haplotype sequencing has been used to, to monitor migrations all over the world. We have very different haplotypes that are associated with Native Americans, 
they're most closely related people in Siberia, et cetera, et cetera. So that approach was used here to determine the relationship between Utsi and other people that still live in Europe. Also, Utsi was infected with three different organisms. The first was the worm, the whipworm, Trichura trichuris, which is a common infection and probably led to significant gastrointestinal problems for him. Interestingly, he was carrying birch fungus with him in one of those birch baskets, and that's considered to be a potential anti-helminthic compound. Very interesting. Another thing that he was infected with was Helicobacter pylori, which of course is associated with ulcers, another source of gastric problems for the guy. But interestingly, it is what is referred to as HP Asia 2 strain, which is today only found in northern India and has been in the past found in Southeast Asia. So where did that come from? It's extremely rare in Europe today. Interestingly also, he had a number of tattoos. Now, the reason I bring this up now is that some people think that there was a belief at that time, I think some people still believe this today, that tattoos are potential therapeutic. And he had them all over his body and it may have been not just for decoration, but for uh, what was believed to be a therapeutic application. The third infection was with a Borrelia species, Borrelia burgdorferi being the bacterium associated with Lyme disease. Initially, that's what they thought this was, but upon further analysis found that it's a different species of Borrelia, but probably also a tick-borne disease that he harbored as well. Also, the DNA analysis indicated that he was lactose intolerant, which is true of a lot of people in Southern Europe even today, but this was a time when dairy was first being introduced into a lot of these cultures, and it seems to have uh, selected for people who are lactose tolerant in places where that was a major source of calories. And he had a genetic history that suggested that he was prone to atherosclerosis, but he died at 45 years, so it probably didn't affect him all that much by that point. So I want to talk a little bit about his diet which we know quite a bit about, interestingly. Also from DNA analysis, but as well as that, from pollen analysis, something that I talked about recently. It appears that he had had at least two meals over the course of the last day or so, the last one being probably about eight hours before he died. And it consisted of a variety of things. For instance, he had eaten einhorn wheat, which was significant crop in Mesopotamia at that point. He also had consumed barley with herbs, which was probably consumed in the form of bread, which also was very popular at that point, a major source of calories. But beyond that, he had meat, what appeared to be dried meat. The evidence for that had to do with small pieces of charcoal that were found in his gut, probably not from cooking, but from the drying process on the meat. So it was meat from ibex, it was meat from red deer, it was meat from an animal called a chamoy, if you're not familiar with, it's sort of a, a goat antelope-like animal. So he had all that, he also had berries, he had fruits, one of which is called a sloe, if you're familiar with that. And they found the actual pollen from these, so they could identify them quite well. He also had seeds from flax and from poppy. I mean, this guy had quite a, quite a meal for a man out in the Alps wandering around. You know, despite his gastric problems from his helicobacter, his whipworm, and who knows what the Borrelia was doing to him. This man had one heck of a final meal. It was a large variety of foods. It was a lot of food. His belly, by the way, was quite full. And he probably enjoyed it as well as anyone could have, not knowing that in just a few hours, he'd be shot with an arrow and bleed to death. So it's just amazing how much we've been able to learn using DNA analysis, pollen analysis, x-rays, a lot of other technology I didn't get into, like Raman spectroscopy. All these things have been used to learn an enormous amount about this man and his world. And it's astonishing how much we learned from 5,300 years away from the time when he lived. He was well preserved because he probably was covered with snow and later ice after he passed away there on the Alps. And it just never thawed out until, you know, starting to see with climate change, the exposure of previously frozen materials. And we're seeing this now also with other cultures. For instance, there have been a number of mummies found in Peru, high in the mountains, suddenly becoming exposed and now being analyzed. And we're, we're going to start seeing a lot more of this, you know, places that were burial grounds for people in, well, for instance, the Inuit people in Alaska and in Canada, starting to find some of those remains. There's actually some concern about this, where people died of things like smallpox or other diseases were buried away and, you know, no longer exposed for centuries, and now suddenly we're being exposed to them again, which is a bit frightening. 
You know, one of the things that's, that's fascinating about this is the fact that these microorganisms in the worm were preserved well enough to analyze 5,300 years later. That's amazing. And it, I would say it might increase the likelihood that we will look more carefully at the remains of, of ancient peoples to understand not just their DNA, but the DNA of the organisms that they lived with. And I'm not so sure that we've done a lot of that to date, except in very specific circumstances where people are looking at the origins of particular diseases in a particular population. So why not look at their microbiome as well, if we possibly can get enough material to get some sense of what the contents of their gut look like compared to ours? We already know there are big differences between humans that live in urban environments like most of us do versus, the, for instance, the San people in South Africa or others that uh, in Amazonia. What do those differences mean? So thank you once again. This is Mickey Yarde for Alteris Associates with our most recent episode and in interesting stories in the history of diagnostics. Thank you so much for watching and I'll talk to you next time.